So I'll be talking about this paper on researcher bias. And they are basically looking at a bunch of studies that make use of machine learning and software defect prediction. So the, the goal here is you have some piece of software and it's a binary classification problem where you want to identify if the software is correct or if there's some issue in it. Uh, so they mostly focus on four different areas here. So when looking at each of these studies, they are looking at the learning method or the model being used, the data that was used to both train and test the model, the input features that they used from the data and the performance metrics that were used to evaluate the models. And they conduct a meta-analysis on all of this data collected. So they have this really huge list of criteria that they go through to find 42 studies that match everything. So uh, they, they were basically interested in finding studies that reported the four things I showed in the previous slide. And across these 42 studies, they had results from 600 experiments, because a lot of these papers report multiple variations of experiments with different models or on different data sets and so on. They look at six variables. So the MCC is a, it's called Mathiv Correlation Constant or something like that. Uh, and that's just a metric that looks at, uh, it's like F1 score, but it looks at all four components of a confusion matrix. So it's just more reliably uh, quantifies how well a model performs, even in cases where the data is imbalanced. And so uh, they use the results from the papers to compute the score. So there's a uniform score to compare all experiments against. They also look at the year the work was published. They group the classifier based on the classifier family it belongs to. And they do the same for the data set, the metrics used. The metric in this case refers to the it's more about like the features that were extracted. They call it input metrics for some reason. And they also look at the researcher group that performed the study. So they first plot like a histogram of all the prediction performances as found by the MCC across all the different experiments. And it's a normal distribution, which is not super surprising. And uh, they found that like the mode here is actually between 0.3 and 0.4, which is very less. And they also like plotted out the score with respect to time. And they were hoping that methods would improve over time, but the trends are not that significant. So I guess the TLDR was that um, at this, during this period from 2002 to 2010, Software defect prediction was not a solved task, and most models were not performing very well. And the predictive performance of none of these models were like super great, and it didn't improve over time, even though they expected it to. So then they wanted to figure out what exactly matters when looking at performance and what um. Uh, what are the contributing factors that affect the performance of these models? So they look at a linear, they first look at each of the four factors, that is the research group, data set, input metrics, and classifier family separately, and see what effect they have on MCC. And they firstly found that all four factors were in fact significant. However, their intuition was that classifiers would be would have the most significant effect, but they found that classifiers in fact did not. It had the least effect among all four, even though a lot of research focuses on improving the classifier and like trying something more fancy. Uh, and the thing that was surprising here was that the researcher group was what ended up having the maximum effect on the response variable, which is MCC here. So then they assume that maybe looking at these independently is what is causing this problem. And maybe 
the, it's the combination of the data set along with the classifier and the features that are used that actually <coughs> contribute to MCC. So then they looked at a four-way random effects model and they found the exact same results as earlier where the research group continued to have maximum effect. And by removing the researcher group, I think they reduced the variance by like 30% or so, or like 20%. So they found that classifiers accounted for less than 1% of variability when looking at MCC and then the researcher group accounted for 30%. And they hypothesized that this was probably because of the level of expertise between research groups and also researcher bias. So there was a statement in the paper that said that researchers are three times more likely to report an effect when they know the treatment groups. And in a lot of these software engineering studies, there's no, uh, they don't do blind testing. So the researchers are more inclined to say that their approach is working. And so they proposed three different uh, directions going forward in order to help overcome this bias. The first was to just document everything that you're doing because every little decision you take contributes to how you get the results. And right now there was not much, there was not enough documentation on the little decisions that were made. And so it was harder to recreate the results or to build on results. The other approach was to just uh, combine studies because if different groups have different uh, have expertise in different areas, then maybe doing some kind of joint study would help improve uh, the performance in both the areas by like merging all their expertise. And the third thing they suggested was blind evaluations, but they compared it with examples in like some medical field and talked about how having some sort of a-B testing where you don't really know whether the treatment is applied or not helps get more fair results on whether the effect is actually taking place or not. But I don't fully have, I, I don't know how you would apply that in like software defect prediction because your software is either correct or wrong. So I don't know how one would do like a blind evaluation in this case because you you have tests and it either runs or it doesn't so is this more like in terms of generating fixes or because the whole problem here is to just identify if the code is correct or not and they don't fully explain how blind evaluation might help in this case but they i think the tldr was that um uh, despite their uh hypothesis or despite the general notion that using better classifiers would help improve this the performance of different models for this particular problem. They found that the researcher group played a much bigger role and classifiers and the data set rarely had any effect on the results. Yeah, this is my last slide. Can you see more about the direction of this researcher bias or how did this work? Is it that I don't know, famous research groups build better models or worse models or something else? They didn't really specify if it was famous or not, but it was more like they, they talked about how like certain groups have more uh, prior knowledge or some of them could also have access to uh, industry practitioners. And so they tend to do better, but uh or like some of them have more resources that they can use, but they don't, I, I didn't really see anything about specific groups, it was more general. Sounds a bit like this is an argument for not anonymous reviewing, right? We know that some people build better models, so we should know who they are, so we can accept their papers. <laughs> Right? Can I interpret it this way? I mean, no, because in this case, then you're just assuming that some. So the thing is, the ML models they used here were things like 
random forest and decision trees and some really old stuff. So it might also just be that I don't think a lot of the trends hold if you actually did the study right now, because I'm I'm sure that there have been more advanced techniques that do better. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess this this re-emphasizes why you need double blind, right? Because you should not know the research group in order to figure out if it actually does well or not. Except some of these models don't work, right? Some work well, some work poorly. To be fair, most of them didn't work. I see. I see. So. <laughs> so. somehow less dramatic than the one last time mm -hmm. with the um, you know the 72 teams testing the same hypothesis yeah you're not, not surprised what you're saying yeah <laughs> like because there's a lot i mean depending on one um, difficult to tell why they could I mean, if you're using an explainable. It's a little interesting that uh, but the finding is the same as last Tuesday, right? That the uh, single most predictive feature of how well these models perform is who trained them. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that's, yeah. that's essentially the same conclusion we have on Tuesday sometimes. That's true. Except over here, it's just more, it's harder because you also don't know which, everybody worked on a different data set. Mm -hmm. So then you getting 90% on your data set does not imply that you would get 90% on my data set. And they don't really talk about that. And I guess with this one and this, they assume that the classifier data set combination would succeed because then you're choosing the classifier and the data set. So that should be greater than the researcher group. And they found that that's not true. Oh, yeah, maybe like research group is actually just proxying for like how they pre-process the data. I mean, data set is incorporating code. Um, but yeah, it, it could be just kind of maybe it's just all hyper precision. Uh, oh, that's so shitty. Uh, but it could be, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, that's just a thought. So I guess one more thing that on Tuesday, the finding uh, was mm -hmm. that. Even when accounting for everything they could measure that was different between the different teams, they could still not explain the overwhelming majority of the variance in the outcomes. Uh, how well can these people explain the variance in how well these models perform? Not a lot. Like, I think the only statement they had towards the end of the paper was something like, so since researcher groups are like account for 30 percent of the variance and everything else is less than that of the variance explained i assume but not of all the variance yeah of the variance explained they said that maybe if we remove the researcher group it'll be you can see a difference of like you can reduce that variance to 20 percent i was trying to find the paper and pull it up but uh for the researcher groups they actually just have like this huge table with uh the, the references of all the actual researchers oh the thirty percent of all the variables I think it's a lot of variables. Yeah.
So this is like this is different. the Go ahead. sorry. This is like the stable of researcher groups. So they literally group the researchers. It's not how they pre-process or any of that. I was going to say this is a much more predictive setting than the one we had on Tuesday. On Tuesday, the most they could explain of all the variants in the outcomes was like 5% overall. Here, they're explaining a lot more of the variants. So, some, so you know, we had a discussion on Tuesday about how maybe there's something super hard about that question and hypothesis they were testing uh, that makes it so high variance. This one seems to support that. And this one is overall less variance. It's more easy to explain the differences. Yeah, but I don't know. That explanation was not super convincing. Or like all they say is just maybe researcher groups have different skills. Right, that's kind of my thing. Right? I feel like it's easier to accept the conclusion that some research groups can produce more confident models and some research groups are less confident. And it's easier to accept that than it's than last week where it was some research groups confidently say this and some confidently say on the same data. Yeah, on the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was more depressing. I agree. Tuesday was more depressing. Okay. More thoughts on this? Twice. Okay, very good. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, Courtney can hear me. Okay. Or is it yes? So. Okay. Um. Okay. So, I'll be presenting these large scale study on programming languages and code quality in GitHub. So I'll start by presenting what is the problem. So one of the first questions that arises in the paper is that sometimes we don't know what programming language is actually the right tool for, for the job. So there are different properties that programming languages have. And sometimes we don't know which one is the more adequate one for for this job so what they're trying to understand in in this paper is what is the effect of programming languages on um, on software quality so they present um four research questions uh the first research question they try to understand uh if there are some programming languages that are more uh, uh defect prone than others they also try to understand, okay, so which are the language properties that can relate to, to these uh, defects? Um, do languages defect proneness depend on the domain? We'll see what domain is in a second. And they finally, they try to see if there is a relation between a programming language and the bug category that, that they may have. So, what was the methodology that they followed? So what are the study subjects? So they took the top 17 programming languages from GitHub. It was actually 19, but they excluded CSS, ShellScript, and Vim, and added TypeScript, which is a superset um, of JavaScript. And they took the top 50 projects, uh, primary written 
uh, in each programming language. Uh, so we'll see how they did this. So how and what data was collected? So for the top languages, they search uh, throughout all the projects uh, on top and counted the number of projects with the language has primary language. And they tried to check if a language was a primary language by counting the number of files that had that extension uh, in the project. And to get the 50 projects per, um, per programming language, they counted the number, the top, they counted the number of stars of all the projects for the programming languages and obtained the uh, 50 projects with more than, uh, with the most uh, stars, but excluded the ones that were small that had for less than 28 commits. Uh, they also tried to obtain uh, some information related, for example, uh, the names uh, of the authors, uh, information about how many contributors were in the, in the repository, uh, the commit stage, if they were merged or not merged. And in the commits, they try to search for specific uh, um, keywords, for example, error, fix, fault, flaw, issue, uh, to search for uh, bugs in, in these commits. Uh, this is an example. Uh, these are the languages and the example of the projects that they um, obtained. Um, more in more detail, uh, for example, for the C language, they obtained 22,000 uh, K lines of code uh, of programs in C. For example, for Perl, they obtained 86. Um, these are two examples of uh, uh, languages and uh, lines of code and commits and all this information that they obtain. So um, with all this information, they did some language categorization in terms of some of the properties that languages have. For example, which type of programming paradigm do they have? Uh, what type of compilation class, type class, memory, if it is managed, unmanaged. And they also um, try to identify uh, each project in terms of its domain. For example, if we have a MySQL uh, project, they classified it as a database project. Or if we have a Linux uh, project, they, they put it in the middleware uh, domain. Um, everyone good so far? Yeah. Okay, so they also tried to search for what types of bugs exist. So they did this keyword search, which means that, um, so if they had uh, um, a bug message with the keyword deadlock in it, they would automatically automatically categorize that has a concurrency issue, for example. And they did this to a specific set of keywords. And then they tried to use these uh, to do a supervi supervised classification, meaning that for all the remaining uh, issues, they try to um, trace some of the other keywords and automatically classify uh, the remaining uh, issues. And this was the methodology they, okay. So finally, the most important part methods. So in the following results, we're going to see different re regression models. So they used the negative binomial regression, which I was not, um, didn't know. And what this means is that since there it may be um, a great variance, for example, a great variance in, in terms of the number of, of responses to the mean, um, they use this type of. Yeah. 
we talked about yeah, I, simple linear regression yeah. or linear regression, um, which is the most basic. But all of these other ones are, work in a very similar way. So, uh, we talked about the basic one. Mm -hmm. Once you figure that one out, you can send each one. Um, when your outcome variable, the response variable, the thing on the left hand side, the thing you're modeling, when that's the count of things, uh, and I think in this case, it's the count of bugs per file or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, when is it count of things? You often need to use a different class of models than the simple linear models we've been talking about. So this is an instance of that, and you know they talk okay. about the reasons for you know, choosing this. It, it seems appropriate in the context. There's another version of these called the Poisson or quasi Poisson, uh, for the same reason. It depends on the distribution of these uh, variables. You choose a different class of models, but ultimately it all works the same. So you know, like when you do this R. Uh, other than a slightly different API call, everything that we talked about in terms of, you know, you have to do diagnostics and how you interpret the coefficients, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is essentially the same as what you've seen already. Thank you. And so they also use uh, a variance inflation factor to uh, to just make sure that excessive um, multicollinearity uh, may not be an issue and has for decoding. So they wanted to make sure that each coefficient um, was related to a particular language. And so they used an, something that is called effects coding. And since uh, each language had a different number of, um, of projects associated to it, they used the uh, awaited uh, effects coding to, to consider that. So at this, on this last point, remember the discussion we had when we talked about modeling factors? So having triple variables. And like often you would get a coefficient for you know all but one of them, all the values of that categorical variable. Like you know, we looked at gender with a binary distribution, and you know, we had a coefficient for say male or something, we didn't have one for female because it was implied as the baseline. Right. So this is Kind of you know about that or how uh, this case, I guess language was the categorical variable. So if you do nothing, if you just do the default thing in R, you get um, estimates of coefficients for uh, all other languages, but the alphabetically first one, right? So you get everything else relative to the alphabetically first one by default. So it sounds like here they did something slightly different that made more sense. That kind of I guess he's the interpretation of these coefficients. Um, and so let's see some of them results and see what actually are um, some of these properties of the programming languages. So for the first research question, are some languages more defect prone than others? So um, after uh, an analysis of the, um, the defects on the um, uh, commits that they analyzed, they saw that, for example, the languages that there are some languages that may have a greater association with defects than others. From, for example, in here we could say that since C plus plus has a higher coefficient. Uh, it means that it's more prone to have defects than, um, for example, Perl or Clojure. Um, for the, the other research question, they asked which language properties relate to defects. So in this case, they modeled all the properties because um, some of them were correlated if i understand yeah these properties were highly correlated and yeah uh, in this case they saw that for example functional programming languages um had a uh, uh, significant uh, 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 less defects than uh, for example, procedural or scripting languages. 
more. Um, so does language defect proneness depend on the domain? So they had these different domains that each project was uh, uh, put into, and they tried to analyze um, if each programming language for each type of the domain, if there was uh, a sort of uh that pro if that programming language in that domain um could introduce more uh defects into the program uh after uh removing outliers from the data they saw that there was no relationship between the domain and the language that was uh that was uh being used in that specific domain and finally, um, for the relationship between uh, the language and the category, they um, for each of the category of uh, for each of, of the domains, they analyzed all the languages at once um, and checked. Uh, okay, which of the types of bugs uh, each language uh, um, actually is more uh, prone to have defects on. And for example, they saw that uh, the same language uh, for the memory was more prone to have uh, bugs than uh, uh, other language that had memory man management. Um, and this was it, an overall presentation without introducing my opinion so far, because we'll be doing that in a second. One thing which I think was a helpful context in reading this paper is, or at least I personally didn't know that there were certain stereotypes associated with each um, programming language. And uh, I think understanding that in context of the paper, I think, was also sort of. I can't really speak to it because I actually didn't know how much of this area prior. I think that's. Perhaps I, I can say something. I found something interesting. I didn't read the other paper not to get biased, but I find I found something interesting was, for example, they analyzed 22,000 questions from C, 22,000 K, and only 86 for Perl. I don't know, but it seems a big gap in terms of. I can add something to this. So because I read the other paper, and so the the so they they the largest so they collected a bunch of projects from each language, and the largest the third largest project in Perl has sixteen lines of code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If it were me, I would probably not read too much into the curl part of the sample. Mm -hmm. Would be a like, solution here. It seems just, I would probably not have included it because it's so small. So, so the K doesn't say for people, I guess. Oh, it does. Okay, the target of the third largest has 16. I think it's no, it's actually just 16. Oh, so the top two. I guess continue with the next. Yes. I thought the top is ranked by stellars instead. So the third most popular, it might not be the third largest, but the third most popular experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Oh, that could be it. Yeah. Oh, that makes more sense. Yeah. Oh, so then, then I think about like maybe it's styles and lines, it's not negative. Yeah. So maybe it's fine. I, I, I missed the K. Though. So I, I take your point is more C they looked at than Perl. Mm -hmm. But in absolute terms, it sounds like a lot of Perls. Yeah. 
One of the things that's been sort of new about um, some of the methodology in particular, how they identify it, you know, identify bugs. Uh, all they do is search on uh, words for uh, very specific phrases. They don't even have like approximately, this is very anecdotal, not scientific, but one of the really common things, keywords I see for fixing a bug, literally just fix a bug. That's not in here. <laughs> so, uh, the, their, their list of keywords and phrases is very arbitrary and very incomplete, which could also mean that results based on this. Fix was in there though, right? Was that not to your pattern? Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah. yeah it's missing. Much. Let me also put you on. Let me turn back to the audio uh, yeah. on the thing just in case it's better for Zoom. I'm going to turn this one on, so maybe you can use the other one. All right. Zoom about whether there's audio. We're trying this conference room mic. Is there any sound coming? Sound coming. Yes. Okay. And uh, Courtney says yes. All right, thanks. Um, so, so Luke's comment was about the keyword keywords they used. It sounded like the one you mentioned as an example or as a uh, counterexample. It sounds like that one was captured, maybe. Right. So, what I um, what I did was I remembered seeing the table and I forgot. Um, I read this this morning, um, but I forgot this line which says um, they did it in a two phase thing. So, if you they first identify that certain commits are bugs and then classify them. I thought it was all in one step. Um, and in their classification, they don't have fixed in there. So I, I missed the first step, which uh, mentions the fixed bug. This too hasty. Gotcha. Any more thoughts on this? I think it's not surprising that this generated so much social media attention. Because it's kind of like perpetuating the age old like programming language stereotype, the functional strongly type language is better. Than <laughs> um, but I think there's a lot of compounding variables that they don't take account for in this paper. Like some languages are more, it's like culturally more appropriate to write a bunch of tests for that, which might end up with more commits that are related to bug fixes. Have a huge test suite. And similarly, some languages I think are likely to have like commercial developers working on or professional developers working on that instead of like open source or like casual developers, mm -hmm. which might make a difference. So I think one, maybe one thing in their uh, defense is the projects they picked for each of these languages were the top most popular ones and there's you know there's some expectation or correlation between overall popularity on the platform and if you will uh, maturity of you know the practices that are used in those projects like you will tend to see that uh, the better software engineering practices often correlate with higher popularity uh, you know that the really unpopular on start projects are often garbage but the super hyper popular ones are you know often decent so you know maybe in that sense that sort of homogenizes this a little bit and it takes some of that away i don't know i don't know i think it's a good point though i agree with the point well like for example linux definitely has companies that are interested in work on their own whereas like, like javascript I guess probably how old JavaScript is doing that joke, but that's really some of the other languages they mentioned. It could be, yeah. I know. It could be. But isn't 
the entire like the the goal of having new programming languages is to solve or to reduce the number of bug or defects. For example, the the reason to 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 have those managed language is to avoid memory bugs. Mm. So, isn't this paper trying to confirm that? Like, like basically to confirm that the PL research is actually meaningful. Mm. So I, I think from this perspective, I actually do agree with the, like the findings from mm. the paper. Mm. Any more support or opposition? So we talk about the second one. Come back. Okay. So that here. Um, see this one. Okay. Okay. So a disclaimer: this these slides are mostly not mine. So I I found uh, I I also watched the talk. This paper is very interesting. Um, and this is this is most this is a replication study of the paper we were just discussing. So it's called on the impact of programming languages on code quality. I just need to get the zoom thing out of my way. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay, so if we were just discussing this, but then. Um, so the original paper was uh, what we were talking about in this replication study targets specifically the, the, the takeaway, the, the, the most important takeaway from the uh, other paper, which is the SARQ1, are some programming languages more defect prone than, than others. Um, and so this is, this is what they try to, to replicate in this paper. And so if you recall the methodology, they had just a very quick overview. They collected 800 projects, uh, written in 17 languages. They split files according to each language, filtered out some projects that had a little commits, and then used the commits as a proxy to decide whether something was a bug fix or not. Uh, and so this is what I was telling you, that they're, they're doing a reanalysis of RQ1 or some language, programming languages more defect on than others. And that's the takeaway. If you see here, you, you can see that uh, C++, for instance, is um, more it's correlated associated with bugs than something like TypeScript, which is negatively correlated with, uh, with, with bugs. And so what they do to do this reanalysis is that they try to validate the data, data acquisition, the data cleaning, and then the data analysis too. Um, and so they, they found a bunch of issues, um, or they claim to have found some issues. And the first ones are related to data collection. And so to show you some examples, uh, the first issue they, they talk about in the paper is related to duplication. So uh, when they were collecting the, eight, the 800 projects, um, they collected a bunch of duplicates. For instance, this is, I think, the most prominent example. They have uh, 17 forks of Bitcoin uh, in the data set. So that means this all adds up, gives us like 2% of the commits are uh, actually duplicated, which is not a lot, but it's still something. Uh, so that's the first issue, duplication. They didn't control for duplication. The second issue is related to uh, the data being truncated. So when they were trying to recollect the data from GitHub, they found out that 20% of the commits were missing from the data set from the same projects. And so this is, um, I think the most notorious example is Perl. So if you see Perl there, 80% um, of the commits were missing for Perl for some reason. Um, missing where? Missing from the data set. The original paper data yeah, set? Yeah. So then, so when they get like fetch data again, mm -hmm. they found these commits. Yes. But they weren't in the they weren't in that data original data set. That's why we had so few early mm -hmm. things. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the second issue. A lot of commits were missing. And then Another issue was related to the TypeScript data. And I think this is an interesting one. So if you look at the data set, the first commit for TypeScript they have is, uh, was submitted in 2003. <laughs> but if you go to the Wikipedia page of TypeScript, 
you see the Kype script was first appeared in 2012. Uh, so what's, what's going on here? So what they were doing in the original paper was that they were using these uh, extensions, files extensions, .ts, uh, to decide whether a, a file was TypeScript or not. Um, and so that's why we have commits of TypeScript dating from 2003. And so, and this paper and the replication study, they went through the data, the, the, the TypeScript data, and they found out that only 35% of the files that were labeled as TypeScript were actually TypeScript. And remember that one of them, the takeaways from this paper was that TypeScript was negatively correlated with, with bugs. And that's because most of the stuff they had there which was not code. So <laughs> no, there was no, no bug, bug. No, no bug fixing. Yeah. How did they, so when they went through again, how did they determine whether it was actually I have no idea. We, we can look that up. Um, and so then, okay, this is another issue which is related to something Luke was talking about earlier, uh, which is labeling accuracy. So they were using like a bag of words keyword matching to decide whether their commit was bug fixing or not. Or not. So these are some examples. For instance, the first one, their fixed comments is labeled as bug fixing, which is arguably not a bug. The second, the, the second one is labeled as bug because it has the word fault on it, even though it's default, not fault. <laughs> mm. And then the third one uh, is not labeled as a bug fix, even though it is because it's closing an issue that's uh, related to, to a bug. And so to, to uh, verify or to get some sense of how, how much noise there was in the data, in this paper in the replication, they um, validated a sample of the, the label data they, they 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 got from the original paper with the original with uh, real developers. I think it was like four hundred something um, commits, and they found out that there was a thirty six percent false positive rate. So there, that means there were uh, 36 percent of the commits were labeled as bugs for, that were labeled as bugs, but weren't actually bugs. And then, and the, there was also eleven percent false negative rates. Uh, so some some were reported as not bugs, but were were bugs. So that's the fourth issue. And then this is this is this is uh, what they had on the data. Um, did they also talk about some uh, issues with the actual analysis uh, uh, of the data? And the first one is related to multiple hypothesis testing. So in this. This paper, they're not testing just one hypothesis. They're testing for each programming language, whether it is um, positively or negatively correlated with, with bugs. Uh, and they're using uh, p values for this, which is something we discussed uh, to be uh, unsuitable because you're bound to get uh, to find something that isn't there if you use uh, p values that are not sufficiently low. So you can see, for instance, like Ruby, they're using a p value of 0 0.05 which is really high uh, if you're testing these many uh, hypotheses. So in the paper, they talk about the actual value they should have used uh, and some other alternative statistics they should have used in this setting. Uh, but, uh, they never use this uh, p-value this low to test their hypothesis for the correlation. And then, the, um, so that's this, this is it on the hypothesis testing. And then the, Sixth issue was something, I think, so they have a bunch of stuff here related to uncontrolled effects. So the first one they talk about is they, um, they uh, saw that the developers were influencing multiple projects. Uh, I mean, um, they saw that 10% uh, of the, the contributors to the projects uh, uh, were accountable for more than 50% of the commits. So uh, that's something they didn't control for. They also did not consider that some tasks are more error prone than others. And for instance, if you're writing Linux kernel in C, uh, you might, uh, you probably will uh, encounter or do more mistakes than writing a small script in something like Perl or uh, scripting language. And they, this is also something I was talking about earlier. They don't control for commercial or uh, open source software, which we, we talked about earlier. And this is, all I have, so I think, so this is, this paper just says that everything in the other paper is wrong. So I would take like, some of these results with skepticism. Um, there is a rebuttal from the uh, original authors of the paper. 
there is also a rebuttal to the rebuttal. <laughs> from the... So you went down the rabbit hole? I, I stopped here. I, stopped here. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I stopped looking at this one. There is more. Um, but yeah, this is this is what I have on this paper. Cool. Let's talk about it. Was there a conclusion after the effects all they did, did they the, oh they they yeah the conclusion is that the results are all meaningless. Do they have new they they have like they have they get so this table that is that I showed you earlier, they come up with a new one, a new version, and everything is statistically insignificant. This the new version of this table says that everything is statistically insignificant. Basically, there's no correlation. They didn't between. find any correlation, yes. Nice. So, in the first time, I made misses, do they not perform a manual validation at all? Interesting. Some, I think, but maybe less than the second one. Okay. What do you think? Central. <laughs> I feel like a lot of shows how a lot of decisions can add up to make things to make completely different results, I guess. This is the part I want to question though. Like, to what extent fundamentally are these different results? Because if you go back to the original. They report with some correlations, and then they also, in the same sentence, say that the effects are small. So you know, yes, there's some correlations, but also no, there aren't any correlations, really. So the less careful paper uh, found something and said, yeah, but math. And then the more careful paper came back and said, uh, none of the original, which is, I think, fundamentally, the same conclusion. It's, it's also a map. I think what the the second paper in their presentation they did a good job of explaining the motivation for writing the second paper in the first place, which was the the authors of the first paper did a good job of exactly saying that the effect is so small that don't read too much into it. Mm -hmm. But since everyone on Twitter was freaking out, and since programming languages people have wanted to hear this message for so long. Um, it had an outsized reaction. Mm. Because people didn't read the fine print. Right. And so in, in those cases, maybe writing this super intense rebuttal was appropriate. I don't know. Mm. Cool. Is, oh, yeah. I, I was just going to say, like, is the takeaway, like, Rather than in your abstract saying uh, it has a significant effect, but the effect size is small, like stated in more plain English by saying, like, they don't say it's statistically significant, they say significant. So they would just say that there's not any meaningful effect. And then, like, outside of your abstract, like, buried further in the paper, say, yes, it is statistically significant, but again, it's not actually significant. I say, like a sort of a as an aside, I love the completely like false, probably hypothetical that there was some secret cult of TypeScript developers. You think of a version of like it's just 2003. But aside from that, which is hilarious, um, I think part of it too is that like there's an inherent value in illustrating what the proper method should be, regardless of what the conclusions are. Hmm. I guess I ran into a situation in some of the research I've done for this class where a bunch of existing surveys on Rust are like using a way of hooking into the compiler, um, or at least that doesn't necessarily like can cause you to miss a lot of like valuable data. Um, but like if you were to rerun some of those studies now, there'd be methods of gaining back some of it. And I guess it's it's like it, even if the like 
results would be the same. It's useful to have like a model showing, okay, if you're doing this type of study, here is the approach that you should be taking. Here are all the pitfalls that you can't come into. Um, because without that, then you just have this flawed approach standing alone or challenged. Yeah, I actually, I agree with that. I think that the real value of this second paper is to step through and say, what, um, yeah, clarify that the methodology was not good, even if the conclusions end up being the same. Uh, I guess the, the, the other thing, I think, um, lesson from both today and um, Tuesday, uh, is that um, your, your messaging and your um, story matter just as much as your results. Mm. Uh, last time um, with the like network paper and mentorship paper, uh, the, the methodology was what it was, but the discussion section, the, the part they chose to emphasize in the discussion section was ultimately what the, the issue was. Mm -hmm. Here, they've chosen some very dubious language. Significant effect is, it's a statistically significant small effect, but it, so the, the language they've chosen, sort of the headlines read different than do not properly accurately represent the me methodology. Just to be fair, they do say modest in the same sentence. They say- Oh, they do, okay. They say mo literally, right? I'm looking at the screen. Modest is the the effect was pretty tiny though. Um, I'd have to go check the, the numbers, but um, well, it's modesty. Yeah, modesty. <laughs> well, it's that's amazing. I mean, I'm kind of sympathetic with somebody trying to publish results, and then people are going to frame it the way that we'll sure. That's right. So I mean, yeah, it's not something that people don't do intentionally or unintentionally. Sure. I think another thing that they mentioned in the second paper was also how people misunderstood the results of the original paper and or like editorialized it mm -hmm. a bit and maybe misquoted it, which probably propagated a lot of misinformation. That was your point. Yeah, kind of, I'm like just thinking about what Luke and Sam were just saying, and I agree so much with that like science communication needs, I think, to be completely overhauled. And for one example, which I think is moving in the right direction, is like PNAS, I think the journal, how now has the abstract and a significance paragraph. And so the abstract is like the abstract for scientists to read, and the significance is any person should be able to read this paragraph and take away what the meaning is. And I think everything should have that. It's a balance because. A lot of times, um, it's not the authors themselves, like in science, probably taking things out of context. So it's kind of a debate of how to like, a good example is like, there's a lot of headlines right now that say like a death beam pointed at Earth from space because there's a black hole, but it's actually not pointed at us. It's like slightly off angle to us, but you keep <laughs> seeing this headline. Um, and so like some mister like, I don't know, it's, I, I agree that it's true that scientific communication should be better, but a lot of the like bad takes sometimes are like totally independent of the researcher. Um, I don't know enough about this specific sort of story though, like the drama surrounding it. I don't mm -hmm. pay attention to people's. I, I can interpret that in two ways. Like, for if, if you have like a media outlet reporting on your um, article, you have no control over what that media article can say. They can spin it however they want. Um, at the same time, maybe it's, I don't, I'm proposing, throwing out an idea that it is the researcher's responsibility to, at least in their abstract, try to represent their findings as clearly and accurately as possible instead of trying to spin their work in as positive a way um, as possible to try to get it published because the research can be viewed as positive, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think reflecting on this discussion, like I, I don't know, I think I still more or less agree with what I was saying and what Luke is saying. However, my, I probably, my, my more revised position would be that like we're, doing all this with the benefit of hindsight and be like, oh, look, there's this like replication study that tore this bunch of shreds. And so therefore like they should have known better. But like, I feel like if I were the author of this paper, I look at this abstract 
And I'm like, yeah, we said modest in the same sentence is significant. And then we have this like, however, we hasten to caution, blah, 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 at the end of the abstract. It's like, that feels like you're, you're being pretty clear about the limitations of your results. And so like, I feel like it would, I don't know. I feel like it'd be, it's just hindsight. That's like, oh yeah, obviously this is gonna cause a whole bunch of FP nerds on Twitter to say that Haskell is better than C. I don't know. I mean, I think along those lines, empathy is important. Like, who here hasn't made a mistake, like using .ts as a classifier? Like, I, I've no, not that specific thing, but like, I know I've done that type of thing at least research many times. At least, maybe not in a publication because um, they don't have any. Not that you won't make any mistake in publication. <laughs> But like it's uh, I, yeah, it's it's we're we're all human, um, and it it seems from the their phrasing that uh, at least they weren't were weren't making a very blatant attempt to misrepresent the results in addition to the mistakes. I guess then this. It's, Philosophical tangent. What is the? I agree that everybody does make mistakes. Sometimes. <laughs> um, that's like fundamentally human. So, what should be the research community's um, process for handling mistakes? This comes into something where I think part of the current format of research could be changed in the sense that I feel like a lot of the work in CS is very much like living document type of stuff. But then we publish these static papers. We go through the series like this linear chain of rebuttals. Like it, it feels like there should be more support for retroactively. Like I, I don't know. I I'm, I'm probably echoing some of what Josh talks about sometimes, but it's like it would be cool if we had this as like a website where we had live data um, directly embedded, mm -hmm. and that could be updated and changed. We could like see a revision history of the same document mm -hmm. versus having to have this one static example of that data. Um, where that sort of lives forever as this one record of the state versus mm -hmm. something that had a flaw in it, but could have had other value that could have been salvaged. I guess, you know, for me, the one one point I really want to leave you with, I, I hope I managed to imprint this on you, is if you actually look, the thing that bothered me, the thing that really bothered me about this whole story is not that the original authors made some mistakes and that a replication study, you know, done years later with more knowledge of how to analyze this kind of data, uh, identified and corrected some of those. By the way, if you read the rebuttal to the rebuttal, the original authors, you know, identified mistakes in the rebuttal. <laughs> like, it's not like, you know, it's not like the rebuttal authors are, you know, without any, you know, reproach. But anyway, so that's, a, that's a tangent. The thing that really bothered me about this is not you know, that replications find flaws in original studies, because that's fundamentally what all science is. That's what it should be. That, you know, that's why I've told you from day one that there's never a single study that, uh, you know, that we draw any meaningful conclusions from. It's all just this accumulation of knowledge over time through replications and meta studies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the normal process of science. So there was nothing abnormal fundamentally about what happened here. The thing that bothered me uh, instead just the lack of elegance with which this was handled. Like, I don't know if you've seen, if you've seen the talk, for example, that the replication authors give about the original paper. It's, it's, it's just, I've never seen anything in, in our community less elegant than so how they handled this. It was the kind of, I don't know, like really petty aggressive stuff you see on social media, absolutely not collegial in, in my opinion. It's like, I'm really upset not about the you know finding flaws, but about the way with which they communicated and, and sort of handled this whole thing, you know, as if as if we're this, you know, uh, uh, the original authors were idiots, and uh, here's how you know we know better, and you know uh, we should have everybody should have known better, and they should listen to us, etc. Like this, the tone with which they did this was, I think, really unbecoming. I'm really disappointed with how this was handled, not with the fact that they found mistakes, which I think we will always do. Like take any, literally any paper, try to replicate it. I bet you cash, take any of mine, I bet you cash that you'll find mistakes. And mine, I'm you know, willing to do this. And by all means, you know, like correct them, fix them. Like I, unless 
you know, unless we were malicious at the original time and like deliberately tried to, you know, uh, manipulate the process or, you know, oversell things that we knew were wrong maliciously, unless we did that, like, everybody does this, it's normal, like by all means, like we did the best we could at the time with the knowledge we had, right? Come do it better by all means, like I will welcome that, I will even help you. <laughs> right, so that, that's, you know, that's, why I chose to talk about this is not so much that you know it was a replication that found issues, which I think is always the case, but it's because I was really disappointed with so the, the human aspect of how they handle this. I think you know, if you watch if you watch the talk, which is recorded it's all over YouTube, there's I think a couple of versions of it. If you watch the talk where they talk about the replication, it's really disappointing, you know, how they handle this to me. I have another question. Many papers such as this one cited this paper and has a basis, for example, yeah. for our motivating their work. And I was just checking this year from RCC. The original study, you mean? The original yeah. study. Last week we saw that one of the papers were re was retracted because mm -hmm. This paper be retracted not to allow further studies to rely on mm. it since it's Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know that I know the answer to this because at some level, like some of this, you know, citations and whatnot is the you know, secondary authors misinterpreting stuff from the original paper and using it as motivation for something they're trying to claim, you know, and the follow-up papers, right? At some level, you know, as I was arguing in the beginning, the conclusions of the original study and of the replication at some level are quite the same, that there is hardly any effect of language on defects. So I, I guess if you reason about it that way, you know, that may be a little wrong with the original paper. What I was worrying is um, we're, I don't know, we're building, if something is wrong in the bottom and we're building more and more research yeah. over something that is wrong, yeah. then I don't know, the point yeah. where we get. So one thing I've seen people do um, is, uh, you know, so a, a publish an erratum or something or amend the PDF to say, you know, here are things that we discovered were wrong in the original paper and here are the corrections, you know, an erratum. Uh, and, you know, uh, please look at this also, you know, if you read our paper, also look at, you know, these corrections. It's, and you know, draw your own conclusions based on this. But you know, we have an updated version of these results with some amendments. You know, please look at that. That's something you can do uh, to at least point people to the most up-to-date version of you know some some paper or results. Feels like what you need. Well, okay. So I I don't know what most of the papers citing this paper say. Like maybe most of them don't mischaracterize it, and only some of them do. But assuming that most of them mischaracterize it, feels like what you need is like. For whatever place people find the paper, like the ACM page or in the PDF, like update the PDF or something or something, they put like a big red banner that says, hey, we've like, we sound by analyzing the citations of this paper that like X percent of people mischaracterize it as this. So maybe think twice when you're citing it, because mm -hmm. what it actually says is more close to this. Mm -hmm. But we don't have something in that like that in our current process for amending. On this, um, a lot of citations to papers are mischaracterizations, regardless of whether the original paper has, has been replicated or not. Like probably most citations I dare claim, I don't know, I've never looked at this, but a lot of citations uh, are taken out of context or misinterpreted uh, on, on any topic, right? regardless of the, you know, the, the whatever replicability of the things you're citing. Well, we, we saw that in the reading group a couple weeks ago, Sam and I, right? 
you know, one of the papers, it refers back to this other paper and it says, look at this system, it's so successful. And if you read the paper, it says, no, it has negative results. It failed. <laughs> Ethically, it failed. It was so sad. How can you say it's successful? Yeah. Yeah. So fix that. Is, right. is, is the problem just that papers are inscrutable? Just are the way that we publish things? No, I think I, I think a lot of the problem is just like the authors of papers make subjective interpretations of their data. You know, the, the authors of these citations make subjective interpretations of the things they cite. Right? They, they read into what they cite to say something or, or not. Hard problem. Yes, there's, there's might be some like inherent ambiguity in language as well. Like the word modest earlier in the abstract, does that mean small? Does that mean how, how big is modest? And different people can interpret that differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe it makes sense to one person to call it to say call it modest, and somebody else reads that as oh no, the actually the effect is it's pretty significant. So well, they do say significant. <laughs> <laughs> I assume they mean statistically. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's tough. Well, so that's kind of that's kind of it, I guess. You know, hopefully, you've learned something about how to do good science, and you've seen a little bit of how hard it is to do even bad science, any science, <laughs> just how hard it is to do science. Hopefully, this was useful. I I had fun, so thanks for joining me on this journey. Can't wait to see what you came up with. Um, I'll send around, sorry, I didn't get a chance. I'll send around an empty slide deck, uh, probably later today or tomorrow. And you can add a few slides about your final projects for Tuesday and Thursday.